Hey everyone, I'd like to invite you all to the February campaign, The Outpouring. Yes, this month is going to be a month of experiencing the outpouring of God. We're going to be focusing on what we can receive from God and what Holy Spirit wants to give to us. We're praying that God will outpour himself and his values and his love into our lives. We're really looking forward to starting a new routine this February where we're going to eat together on the first week of each month. We're going to go out to a local restaurant and we're going to book in, so make sure that you get a deposit paid and make sure that you get booked in to eat with us as a community, as a whole community, on the first week of February. We are really looking forward to the three day of outpouring with William Parker. Yes, we hope that this three days of outpouring will be similar to the ones that we've done in the past. We'll have some food together and then we've got Liam Parker coming all the way from London to come and minister. Liam is well known for his ministry in the Holy Spirit. He ministers to folks individually and as a group and we're hoping that with Liam's help we might be able to experience God afresh together as a community. We really want you to get that in your diary, so make sure you put the 11th, 12th and 13th of February into your diary for three days of outpouring with Liam. Can't wait to have a church breakfast together. Yes, and I can't wait to have a church breakfast as well. We're going to have some food together, we're all going to gather as a whole family and have breakfast together. I can't wait to have some eggs and bacon, it's going to be great. That'll be great. <laughs> I think that February is going to be really, really important for us as individuals and we're praying that as individuals we have God totally poured out into our lives, that we start to receive his values, receive his mindset, that God starts to live through us as individuals. I am convinced that God wants to do something in our church community as well. Jesus once said that they will know that we are his followers by the way that we love one another. My prayer this February is that we will see the love of God poured into us as a community, that we would learn to love one another, despite some of the things that might wind us up about one another, that we will love one another. My hope is that God will start to outpour his love, his peace, his joy into our community through us as individuals and through us as a church community, seeing the love of God, knowing the love of God and be able to show it in the world around us, that we would see people praying in the workplace, that we would see people sharing their faith at school or on the school run. I can't wait. I really hope that you manage to book Sundays in February into your diary, that you get our date for food booked in, that you get our date for breakfast booked in, that you get our date for Liam Parker coming for three days of outpouring booked into your diary. I've got it in my diary. I've got it in my diary. And we can't wait to see you there. Thank you, D. Very professional, D. Um, lovely jubbly. Here we go. Let me just squidge this over a little bit. Oh, all that wine on there, you just know it's going to make a stain on the carpet, don't you? You know what I mean? Like, oh, dear. <laughs> Whew, not going to lie. Someone spilled some wine last week, didn't they? And, uh, and yeah, we, I, I got the old cleaner out straight away, didn't I? It didn't fix it, though, did it? But there you go. Salt. Okay. Cool, there we go, there you go. Stephen, that's your job for next week. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory, okay. Um, we're reading from John chapter 6, if you'd like to join me, and verse 53. Um, so we're going to read verse 53. We're going to read a good few verses here. Um, hopefully you'll be able to keep up with me as I read. Um, but um, but we have been, I've been doing this series, haven't I? Do you know the series? It's called Conversations with Jesus in the Gospel of John. That's right. I started it probably this time last year. And I'm going to keep on going until we've finished it. Are we up for that? Yeah, come on. Hallelujah. I'm also going to restart these uh, TikTok-y videos uh, that are doing the same sort of thing verse by verse during the week. Two or three minute TikTok videos during the week. We're going to carry on doing that uh, once I come back from holiday. And so, uh, and so uh, you will need to follow us on TikTok if you have TikTok, wouldn't you, Josh? You knew that were coming. Excellent. Lovely. Uh, every time he's here, I, I, I take the mickey out of him because he hasn't followed us on TikTok yet. You know what I mean? But uh, we're on Insta, we're on TikTok, we're on YouTube, we're on... Oh, we've got a podcast now, everyone. Did you know that? Yeah. 
Ah, oh, there you go. We're on Spotify. We have a podcast. You can listen to our talks on podcasts. And if you're listening right now on podcast in a few weeks' time, then hit subscribe. There you go. It's obviously Ignite Elim Church. There you go. Oh, sorry, you're asking about the scripture. It is John 6 from verse 53. Um, I'm giving you guys plenty of time to find the verse uh, so that you don't feel like I'm going too fast. And I will quickly find it. Oh, there it is. Um, okay. Here we go. You ready? Everyone got, the, everyone got it? You all got your Bibles open? Okay, lovely. Here we are. John 6, verse 53. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. Oh, we've been talking about that, haven't we? There we go. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I abide in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread, my body, Jesus is saying, will live forever. Verse 59. These things he said in the synagogue, by the way, which is full of Jewish people, all right, who don't like drinking blood. Do you remember that? That's a no-no in a Jewish culture. So these things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore, many of, his, many of his disciples, how many disciples did he have at this point? Oh, you know what, if we was on, if, if we was on that program, QI, you know, you know that one with Stephen Fry, if you was on QI now, you'd get a, wrong. He had lots and lots of disciples, maybe 500 disciples following him around. Okay, not just 12, he had loads of them. So therefore, many of those disciples, when they heard this, said this, is a difficult statement. Who can even listen to it? Right? But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and our life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Some of you who do not believe. We could have 20 people in this room and maybe two or three believe, right? Even though we all think we believe, but there's believing and then there's believing, you know? For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. And he was saying, for this reason, I have said to you, that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. We continue. As a, result of the, uh, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. Many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the twelve that stuck around, <laughs> yeah, because there's believers and then there's believers, you know? The twelve that stuck around. You do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words to eternal life. I've titled my talk today, Sometimes it's hard to follow Jesus, but to whom shall we go? Jesus has the words of eternal life. Um, I was just thinking when I read this about all the different things that people come up with as to reasons why they might not follow Jesus like full on. You know, why they're in 50% instead of 100%. Why they, uh, why they see uh, some parts of their life's change, but not all of it. And to be honest with you, if I'm totally honest, um, over my 15 years of being a Christian, I'm sure my lovely brother-in-law is here today. He was there the night that I'd become a Christian, you know. And, uh, and we got home. Do you remember Mike and I shaking like a leaf? And uh, and uh, the, the ladies in the household turned around and they said, Darren, you look different. Do you remember that? You look different. It's like my face had changed that night. 
my countenance had changed, as they would say in a King James Version Bible. And, uh, and Michael said, well, he's just chosen to follow Jesus. And at that point, I did change lots of things in my body. Michael would tell you, as anyone else would, that straight away I stopped drinking alcohol. That was, a, that was a little miracle that Jesus did in me, right? But then after that, Michael will also tell you that I did not stop being angry. <laughs> right? Liam would tell you that I didn't stop being an angry person. In fact, in all honesty, Liam will say today, Dad, you're an angry person. He's taking the mickey out of me a little bit. Um, but there is this little sense of something still bubbling under the surface. I have therapy for it, I promise you. Uh, I'm hoping that one day it will go away. Um, but, um, but there is a reason that I'm angry. There's a, there's a reason that I sometimes I'm, that I'm, I'm an angry person. And despite following Jesus for so long, for so long, sometimes it doesn't always go the way that I want it to go. But when Jesus says, I want you to be gentle then I'm like yeah but Jesus I believe you made me the person I am I believe that the things that I've gone through have made me the person that I am and and that you're going to use those things to your glory right but then Jesus says the glory is that even though you've been through this turd you're still gentle right so then guess what I have to start doing because if I'm going to be a believer believer then I've got to start being gentle, right? And sometimes what we see is that the things that Jesus says can sometimes grate on our ethics. Do you guys ever notice that? Anyone in the room who thinks, well, I don't totally agree with God's ethics. I'm not sure that, you know, telling the Israelites to wipe out an entire nation was totally ethical. I'm not sure whether I like that. You know that one? Or, um, or, God, I'm not sure that your disagreeing with my lifestyle is totally ethical towards me. I think, like I just said, that because of my experience, which you've made me walk through, that I should keep on living the way that I live. Anyone ever think that? Come on, you're not being honest, are you? Yeah, we do. Jesus, you walked me through this. You made me who I am. And so when I do something naughty, that's your fault, not mine. Anyone ever think like that? Yeah, come on. You all do. Don't lie. Um, <laughs> you do, don't you? Jesus, you made me an angry person, so I'm going to stay an angry person. Jesus, you made me a cryy type of person, so I'm going to cry as much as I want. You know? Jesus, you made me negative. Right? So I'm going to stay negative. And then Jesus says, yeah, but I want you to look on the bright side of life today, sunshine. And then you're like, well, I don't know whether I like that at all. So what do you do? You disappear for a bit, right? Because the word of God is hard sometimes. It's difficult to follow Jesus sometimes. Sometimes he grates on our understanding. You know, so, so the things that he says are just, they're just a bit beyond us. You know, I can imagine the, the people in this passage that we've just been reading, the Jewish people going, Jesus, you know that we're not supposed to drink blood. So what are you talking about? Are you trying to wind us up? What's going on? Why are you saying this stuff? And their understanding is just not there. But the Bible says that his ways are higher than our ways. And that sometimes we'll just never understand the things that he's going to say or do or want us to do. But his ways are higher. And we go, yeah, but if I don't understand it, I'm not doing it. If I don't understand it, then I'm out. I'll be disappearing with the other 500. Thank you very much. Right? Anyone, anyone ever do that? I don't understand, Jesus, why these three things lined up this week. I had one of those weeks recently. Oh, my goodness. It is like, I'm not even lying to you. It's literally like, um, like all of my most stressful things all came into one week all at once. Anyone ever had one of them? Yeah? And then you go, uh, God, what are you doing? Right? Yeah? Now, as it happens, I'll be honest with you, I've had a lot of stress in my life. I think I'm quite a resilient sort of person. And so, uh, and so maybe if I'm really trying to work it out, if I need to work out God, then I can go, oh, it was just stretching my resilience that little bit more, you know. There's, a, there's an old saying in there, with new levels come new devils. You ever heard that before? Yeah, when you go up a level in God, suddenly there's a new devil comes to attack you. And that week, I promise you this, me and Laura both sat down and went, is this a spiritual attack? You know, because I just watched this video on YouTube about, um, about spiritual warfare and I was like messaging some mates like, hey, do you, guys, do you want to do this thing? And then all of a sudden, like three or four things all in one, all, all in one week just went boom and I went, ah! 
Maybe it was a spiritual warfare thing, or maybe it was just God saying, I just want to stretch you a little bit, Dazza. Who knows? But we tried to work it out. We didn't understand it. But do you know what we did? I quit working. I quit being a pastor, right? And then I went and moved to some place elsewhere, really far away. And I sat there and cried in my shed for like five weeks. Didn't bother coming back. That's what I did. Stupid, isn't it? Anyway, um, obviously that's not what you do. You're not one of those 500. Either you're a believer or you're not a believer. If you believe, then you stick around, even though you don't understand it, Right? Even though you don't understand why pastor's saying this thing, speaking on behalf of God. You know, because we believe that I'm speaking on behalf of God today, right? You believe that? I believe that. I'm speaking on behalf of God today. Pastor says something. I don't agree with that. I'm off. I'm like, you're an Egypt. Okay. The other thing that he sometimes challenges is this. He challenges our worldview, doesn't he? You know when God rocks up and says, oh yeah, in the beginning, I created the heavens and the earth and there was nothing. And then in six days, I made everything. On the seventh day, I rested. And then all of us um, who loved school and loved science and that sort of stuff say, we need some evidence, right? I'm not having that. And it challenges our worldview. It challenges to the core, right? Because we're like, I just don't see how that could happen. But somehow I can see how some rocks colliding and just happen to be the perfect moment in history could then make everything just start to happen, right? And I was literally just playing darts with Liam and Michael last night. We were playing darts and, and uh, I hit a treble 20 just the once in a whole night, right? And as I hit it, I thought, isn't it amazing how like this body just here can throw this little tiny piece of metal from about seven foot away and hit it in a space like this? Like, how does that even happen? That's pretty amazing stuff, isn't it? And then that's just me who hits a triple 20 once in one not whole night of playing darts. I was watching the darts championship the other day. Did anyone else watch that? Oh, mate, it was like triple 20, triple 20, over and over again. I was like, what's he doing? And then one day, uh, years and years ago, I remember playing darts with Michael when Michael used to be really, really good at darts. And Michael used to hit the triple 20 all the time, and I just never did. And then, uh, and then he said, you're not allowed to pray, though when you're playing against me. Do you remember this, Mike? And uh, I was like, I'll pray all I want. And I started, started shabba dabba do, do, ding dong in and started praying in tongues. And then, I, uh, and then I had 140 left and Michael was like on a double like 16 or something crazy like that. He's definitely going to hit it. I've got to get out or else, you know? And uh, believe it or not, I went treble 20, treble 20, double 10. Do you remember? And it, the biggest finish I've ever had in my life. I was like, ah! And Michael quit darts. Um, <laughs> it's like, you're not allowed to pray when we play sports. Why? Because God is so good to the weak, you know. Um, <laughs> but sometimes when we think about these things and when God speaks, sometimes he challenges our worldview. And we have a choice. Do we leave and stop following or do we stay despite the hardness of it? Here's the facts. Here's the facts, right? If God is God and he says something is wrong, then who's wrong? Me or him? You're very quiet today. Who's wrong? If God disagrees with me, who is wrong? Me or him? I'm wrong. That's right. If God wants me to live a certain way, but I don't want to live that way, who knows best, me or him? Him. That's right. Come on. If God says, like, believe it or not, sometimes God will say, that's not, the right la- that's not the right lady or man for you. Okay, not when you're married, by the way. If you're married and you've already got into that situation where you're already married to the wrong person, then tough. God already said in his word, you've got to stay where you're at, right? Unless there's certain circumstances that God allows you to get out of that place, right? But for, 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 for some of you young singles out there, I know there's plenty of you. Maybe you can hook up at the end of church and have a little chat, you know. But, but, but if God says that's not the one for you, but you're like, ah, oh, but she has the right hair colour. She has a Bible in her hand. She, she, she's got like, you know, the perfect body, you know. I know you lads are looking at me today thinking he's looking good. Um, and you're like, but God, she's perfect. And then God says... No, mate, she's not the one. Who's right? God or me? God, that's right. Come on. He's not the one. Who's right? God or me? God, every time. Come on, people. It's the same answer all the time. It's Jesus. Jesus is right. And then what we do is we get offended, right? 
Anyone else feel offended when God speaks and says, don't do something you love doing. And then you go, now I'm offended, right? Now I'm offended. So what do I do? I'll go away. You know what? Can I be really honest? Shall we really, come on, let's go really honest today, shall we? Some people just like to be offended. You know them types? They're offended at every opportunity. You know the ones? Oh, yeah. I will always, I will take offence any time I can because you know what? I really, really want to have a bit of an argument or a bit of drama or a storm off. I want people to, you know, come and give me a pat on the back and say, it's okay. Sometimes. Or sometimes it's just where you've been brought up. Everyone at home was always just offended. And so you learn that normal is just being offended all the time. Well, you know what? That's not a good enough reason to stop following Jesus. If he offends you, if he offends you, then you've just got to suck it up and go, I'm going to keep on following. I'm going to do what he says. Why? Because he knows best. God knows best, right? Come on. God knows best. God wants you to stop drinking alcohol altogether for three or four months because he thinks that it's going to be good for your spirit. And you go, yeah, but it's the only coping mechanism I have left. And then pastor says, oh, you know, praise and worship is better than alcohol, right? And then you're like, nah, now you're just trying to get me to come to church every day. So, uh, so because of that, I'm offended, so I'm not going to come at all for three months. I'm like, you thick, mate. <laughs> yes, you're offended at that. Ah! Oh my days, get over it. We disagree with him. We get offended by him. What else are we written here? We get dismayed by him. Like, God, why? Why is all of my life going wrong? And then God is like, Did you do anything that I said? Did you do anything? I gave you a step-by-step -step guide as to how to live a great life. I put some great people around you in your life and they started giving you great advice as to how to live the godly way. And then you did how much of it? Zero percent. And my life is falling apart and it's all God's fault. And I stand there going, like, am I the only one with a brain? You know? Any of you guys feel the same? Yeah? Am I the only one who gets this? And I really feel that, if all honesty, in all honesty, if, if, if Jesus offends us just a little bit sometimes, if the word of God offends us just a little bit sometimes, people just go off and they go off and do their own thing. And even when they don't do their own thing, what they do is they come back and they bitter and they backbite and they're, and they're moaning and groaning and God isn't nice. I'm like, it's God though. God isn't nice. It's God though. God, God isn't ethically correct. God, you cannot be judging God. That's not the way it goes. God judges you. Right? You cannot be judging God because you're not God. God judges you. And he's allowed to. And he's allowed to. Why? Because he created you. And if I... You know what I did this week? I put a new caliper on my Beamer. I went to the BMW garage and I said, can you give me a price on a new caliper? They said, a thousand pounds. I went, oof. I think the wife's going to agree with that. So I went down to the local shop and uh, a, a car park shop and I said, how much for a caliper? They said, 100 quid. I was like, all right then. I'll give it a go. So I went on YouTube. I fitted a caliper. Right? I didn't quite follow the instructions because I'm a proper bloke, you know? <laughs> So I'm just like, oh yeah, I see what it sort of looks like and how you're sort of supposed to do it. That'll do. Whoa, 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 whoa. But I'm bish, bash, bosh. Yes. Drove it out of the driveway. Lovely jubbly. That was all right. Took it on the road a little bit. Brakes working all right. Drove a little bit more. Put my foot down on the brake. Oh, he went all the way down. And I was like, ah, hello. And then suddenly a little light came up, a little yellow light. And I was like, ah, oh, no. Ah, oh, no. And do you know what I did? So you know what I did? I blamed the car for all of my problems. I was like, you stupid car, I made you to work and then you didn't work. And then I sat down and go at it and then the car turned around and said, and said, you know what, mate? You fixed me wrong, so it's your fault. And then me and the car, we had this big argument 
And then it turns out that I'd just forgotten one little cable, so I had to go and buy a new, I broke something. Yeah, I broke this thing called, uh, called a, a brake pad wear sensor. Now, in all honesty, if I'd have followed the instructions, if I'd have followed the instructions of the manufacturer, right? And, <laughs> come on. Hello, people. If I'd have followed the instructions of the manufacturer to the letter, if I'd have seen all the bits that I needed and then done all the bits that I needed to do, and if I did it all first time, then when I pulled out of my driveway, I would have had no lights on, my brake pedal wouldn't have gone all the way to the floor, and I wouldn't have felt like, oh no, my days are going to die. Um, however, when I don't follow all of the manufacturer's instructions, do you know what happens? Chaos. Chaos. And today, maybe you feel like you're living in chaos, but the last time you read the manufacturer's instructions was when you were five years old in school and you read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and you've never read them since. Because why? Because it just didn't agree with your worldview. And then later on, you thought, oh, I might not necessarily read the instructions, but I'll go to church anyway. And when you turned up at church, there's a bunch of people, and they said, you know what, right? Doing this particular thing isn't particularly good for your lifestyle, and it's going to hurt you, and you're not going to have a good life because you keep on doing this thing over and over again. And then what you did was you got upset and offended because these people in the church told you something that God doesn't like in your life, and then you got offended. So then you went, oh, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to go somewhere else instead. And then your life got into a total one at a mess, you made loads of mistakes. You got hurt real bad. And now, for some weird reason, there's all these new ways that you behave because of your hurt. And life is chaotic and messy and dodgy. And it's all because you decided, at some point, stuff the manufacturer's instructions. I'll do it my way. I'll be near the people of God because, you know... When the blessings of God shower on April, it's good to be near April because I get splashed on as well. Right? I like going out for a meal on a Sunday after church. It's one of my favourite things. And so I'm going to go to the meal after church. I like when the blessings fall on me too. I like when people pray for me and I get a fuzzy feeling inside. I like that. I like it when God heals me, even though I'm not really his friend, but he heals me. Because God is God and he's so good. I love being around God, but as for God's ideas and his instructions and the way he wants me to live my life, the way that he says is best, stuff that. I'll go and do it my own way. Are you a believer or are you a believer? Or maybe we can rephrase it. Because there's loads of believers, weren't there? And they disappeared. Who was left? 12 disciples. Loads of people believed, they left. They saw the miracles. They saw him feed the 5,000, literally just before this. They saw the miracles. They all chose to follow him. And then he said something tough. He said, it's time to live a different way. And all the believers left. And the ones who were left with him were those who were disciples. Today, the question is, are you a believer who gets offended and disappears whenever times get tough? Or are you a disciple who's going to follow him no matter what? Why? Because he's God and I'm not. Because he has the words to eternal life. And I don't. There is no other place to get life except through him. And so if I really believe that, there's not really much of a choice, is there? Either I'm in or I'm out. And the question is, what am I? What are you? Are you a disciple? Or do you just like it when you get a little bit of blessing poured on you from time to time? And in the meantime, you do what you want, how you want, when you want. Stuff everyone else, including God who doesn't know what he's on about anyway. Which one are you? Which one are you? Shall we stand? Um, because it's 20 past 11, and so we should definitely stand and get ready to close. Uh, we've got some worship again coming up. But um, obviously, obviously, we have this moment, right? Because uh, we don't preach for no reason. I don't preach for no reason. There needs to be some sort of action to this. And, uh, and the action, I guess, the question for you guys today is, am I a believer 
or am I a disciple? It's great if you're a believer. It's a great first step to being a disciple. It's a great first step to being a disciple, becoming a believer. Lots of you guys have become believers in God because of what you've seen here and because of the way you've been treated well and you've been accepted and that you've been loved and you've received God in different ways. Your body has done stuff. Your mind has done stuff. Your lives have even started to change. Your life has started to change. We've seen it. We notice it, right? We notice it when, when lives start to change. We notice it. Claire, like, oh my goodness, Claire. Best testimony we've had around here in years. Amazing testimony. We love it. We see that. We see lives being changed. That shows you a believer. You might even be a disciple at that point, right? You might even sound born again. Ah, oh, What's the evidence? You know another thing Jesus once said? A tree is known by its fruit. A tree is known by its fruit. The question is, today, are you thorny? Or are you sweet? Shall we pray?